Shabbat Shalom to all everyone. As I've always said, I say it every day, anybody calls me at my home, I always tell them I'm blessed by the best. And that person is I am, Yeshua. All right, when David had put the word out to kind of for us to look into what stone meant, what Aben meant, and the Hebrew word for stone is Aben. It's spelled E-B-E-N, but it's pronounced A-B-E-N, Aben. It is made up of two separate words, Ab, meaning father, and Ben, meaning son. The stone, Aben, is the Hebrew, in Hebrew means the father and the son. The olive is the first character in the Hebrew alphabet and represents God or Heavenly Father. Olive is the picture of the strong leader and is also number one, which points to God the Father. Bet is the house, the tent, the family, the dwelling place, and is also number two, which identifies God the Son. Noon is the picture of life or activity, and is also number 50, which points to the Holy Spirit. The numbers these represent add even more understanding to this mystery. Our stone, our Aben, is the work of the Father in the person of the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament at Luke 648, these, if you like to, you can write these scriptures down for you to look at at your convenience. But in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, Luke 648 states, we are instructed to build our house on a rock and not sand. Therefore, we should build them on a foundation made up of the Father and the Son, the eight men. Several scriptures further expounds on this precious and elect stone. Yahshua stated in John 10:30 that I am, I am my father, the Aben, the stone are one. Acts 4, 10 through 12, Peter's sermon to the council. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Yahshua is the stone, the Aban, that was rejected by you, the Baonim, which is spelled B-O-N-I-M, but it's pronounced Banam, the builders, which became the Rosh Pana, which is the head cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, if you like another example. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given unto men by which we must be saved. 1 Corinthians, I'm just going to give you a few scriptures, says, states, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom all things, and we in him, and the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things, and we live by him. And John, it was interesting when I looked a little bit further, I found a lot of scriptures talking about the stone. I didn't realize how many scriptures in the Bible really talked about this and, and basically said the same thing, but just a little differently. But John 6, 41 through 47, this, the Jews, I'm going to read what the scripture says. The Jews then murmured, complained about Yeshua, the Ibed, the stone. Because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And the Jews said, is not this Yeshua, or Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I've come down from heaven? 
Yeshua therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourself. No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, every man who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Now that any man has seen the Father, not that any man has seen the Father, except he who is from God, the Amen, the stone. He has seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me have everlasting life. Also, there is many scriptures. Uh, I'll give you, if you want to write them down, the st states the same thing. Matthew 21, 42. I'm not going to read it to save some time. Uh, Mark 12, 10 through 11. And Psalms 118, 22 to 23. I'm going to pick one of these for you. I'm going to read John 6, 55. And Yeshua said, Therefore I say unto you, that no man come unto me except it was given unto him of my Father. So what I'm trying to express that the, the Father and the Son are one. They are the Amen. And we must always remember that. In Psalms 118, 22 to 33, I've, there were so many scriptures, so I'm not going to read them all. It says, Aben, which the Boonim, the builders rejected, is become the Rosh Bana, the head or chief cornerstone. This is God's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Even Peter, a disciple of the Messiah, a Yahshua, writes about the rejected stone. He says in 1 Peter 2, 6 through 8, for it stands in the scripture, behold, I lie in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be put to shame. Unto you therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient. The Aben, the stone, the Bonin, the builders rejected, has become the head cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Even Rabbi Paul picks up the same thing in his letter to the Romans believers in Romans 9.30. He says, what shall we say then? That Gentiles did not pursue righteousness, have obtained it? That is a righteous that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that could lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching the law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as it was but as if it was based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. Yeshua, as it is written, says, Behold, I'm lying, laying a, I'm lying in Zion, a stone for stumbling and a rock of offense, and whosoever believe in him will not be put to shame. Do remember, everyone, the rejection of the Savior Yeshua is foolish and absolutely fatal. Unfortunately, many do reject him. He will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Daniel 2, 31 through 45. The prophet Daniel gives a similar picture of the Messiah, liking him to a rock cut out not, but not by human hands, which smashes into the nations of the world and completely obliterates them. Yeshua is, my people, is the sure rock of salvation for those who believe, but an immovable 
stumbling stone for those who do not. Instantly, Peter in Greek means rock. The church will be built upon the rock, but not Peter, but upon the Father and the Son, the Abba and the Stone. Don't forget, Yahshua, the Messiah, is not only the starting place for building our faith, but he is also the one who caps it and completes it. However, let me end this study with some irony. Remember the word Abed is made of the Father and the Son as one. Also Yeshua testified of himself and mentioned this very idea. Ironically, the teachers of the law responded with stones, rejecting him, rejecting his very identity as the stone of Israel. Yes, indeed, I am going to tell you, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. Thank you. That was wonderful. So Exodus 34, chapter 1, was where the assignment came out of. And I'm going to read it here in just a sec. Okay. And it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you broke. Be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and do not let anyone be seen throughout all the mountains and do not let the flocks of herds graze in front of the mountains. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the former ones and he rose early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name, the Lord, or Yahweh. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord is God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousand generation forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin yet by no means clearing the guilty but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children and the third and the fourth generation and Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped okay so as our sister did pointed out in that word stones we see the father and the son we see the Abin the Aleph and the, and, the, and the bet, which forms the word father, the bet and the noon, which forms the word son or ben. Okay, so what, what if the stones, what was written upon it would be what? The covenant, the Torah. So when we're looking at the Torah, we're looking at the father and the son. They're not separated from the Torah. It's not a, a, a law that would lead people into bondage. But if we're going to look at the Son, who is Yeshua, it's going to lead people into salvation. Amen? And so, um, the Lord tells him, you know, he says, bring two tablets. Two tablets. So we know that the number two, the Lord would send out his disciples in, 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 in twos, okay? Why? To be his witness. So the number two is a witness. It's, it's, it's a number of confirmation. And isn't that what Yeshua said? He says, my, my testimony of myself in John chapter 8 is valid. Why? Because the Father sent me. And so when he said that to them, remember, if you study John chapter 8, what's interesting is that we see a woman that was caught in adultery who the Pharisees and the lawyers were ready to stone. So they were using the word stone they were using the word inappropriately. Because anytime you have the word with you, it's going to first be a reflection of what's in your heart. 
And he said, any man that's without sin, let him cast the first stone. Because the word deals with us before it will deal with anyone else. The first person that it will, will convict is us. And so the words, uh, the grace and the power that's on the word isn't to condemn, but to bring life. Amen. Um, let's see here. Let's see. I'll, I'll read John chapter 8, some of that, verses 14 through 18. And Yeshua answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid because I know where I have come from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. Now understand this. These people had the books of Moses. You know, they had scripture. And so it is possible to still have the tablets of testimony, but not necessarily possess the testimony yourself. Remember the tablets were placed inside of the ark. And so they have to be placed inside of a vessel. It has to become our testimony. We have to really truly be brought into a relationship not just simply an intellectual assent to what the Word of God teaches us. Um, he says, you judge by human standards. I judge no one. Yet, even if I do judge, my judgment is valid, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is valid. I testify on my own behalf, and the Father who sent me testifies on my behalf. Then they said to him, where is your Father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. So he's saying that you cannot separate me from my Father. The Son and the Father are one. They, they, they cannot be separated. You cannot separate me from the Torah. Because the Torah reveals both I and the Father. We are the stone, the tablets of stone, the Father and the Son. It's inseparable. And as my sister pointed out, you even have in there the letter, the noon, or in the word stone, Aben. You have the noon, which represents the number 50. And we know what happened on the 50th day after Passover, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Hokadesh. So the word is, is the Torah itself is involved with the Holy Spirit. Remember, Moses is told to give these two tablets, as Pastor Dave elaborated, because what? The first, uh, the, the first giving of the Torah, of the covenant, was broken. Okay? And so what? The, Exodus 34, verse 1, is really a prophetic foreshadowing of how Yahweh would operate once again in the lives of his people. He would come once again to his people representing the covenant. And he would represent it through his son. Amen. Even Moses, his name means what? Drawn out of water. And when we look in scripture, you'll find that when David was confronting Goliath, what did he do? He found five smooth stones and that was inside of a brook. So he took something out of the water. The water always represents the word and the flowing of the Holy Spirit. So we just see this, this supernatural interconnection of the word. That's one, that's one of the things that I love about the word is that it's living. You can read these same passages of scripture over and over and over again and continuously see more and more about the Father and more and more about the Son and what they intend to do on the earth. Amen. So um, let's see here. If you continue down in, in John chapter 8, the people that he was preaching to got so upset with them that they tried to stone him. They tried to use the word. They tried to use a rock against the rock. You know, if we're not careful, we can take the very stone that the, what is it, says the stone that the builders rejected, we, we could take that very word and try to use it against the Lord himself. 
<laughs> it happens all the time. Anytime we twist it away, anytime we try to separate the Father and the Son, anytime we try to separate and say that Yahweh's, you know, like, okay, you, a common thing that we hear all the time is that um, the God of the Old Covenant was cruel and judgmental, and the God of the New Covenant is kind and gentle. Okay, so we know that's false because even as we study Exodus 34, the name of the Lord, the name, the Shem, name is not just, hi, my name is John. No, name in Hebrew, Shem, implies my character, who I am. He says, what, well, I'm gracious and forgiving. I clear, you know, I, I'm forgiving and loving and kind and merciful. So even there in the, in the Tanakh, in the first covenant, we, show, we see him as being, what, gracious and kind. And if the Father and the Son are one, then their character has always been consistent. There's not, never been a dissociation with Yeshua from his Father. It, there's, never been an there's never been a dissociation with Yeshua and his Torah. So, just like with Moses and Israel, the Lord was what? Renewing the covenant. And so when we look at the word re, uh, uh, new covenant, in Hebrew, Brett Hadashah, it, it deals with a renewed covenant, an upgraded covenant. I'm just renewing the covenant. If you have a subscription, and I said that you're renewing your subscription, it means that you already had the subscription, but you're going to continue with it. Amen. Okay, so it's not a brand new covenant as if it was something completely, you know, never invented or spoken of before. It's a renewal of the previous covenant. He says, what, the words that were on the previous covenant, I'm going to write them again here on these two tablets of song. I am the Lord your God, I change if not. That's what the word teaches us. Um, so he's renewing the son, is renewing the covenant to a people who do disobey the first covenant. Even after the word tablets in Exodus 34 verse 1, you find an Aleph Tav. Okay, so in, I believe in Revelation, we'll say he's the Alpha and the Omega. That's the, the Greek, uh, the first letter in the Greek alphabet is the Alpha. The last letter is Omega. But really, we know that Yeshua was not speaking Greek. He would have been speaking Hebrew. And so he would have said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. The Aleph is the very first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It represents the number one as my sister pointed out, and it also represents strength and power. And so the Tav is the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And if you were to look at it in Paleo-Hebrew, the real ancient Hebrew, it would look like the picture of a cross. And so it, 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 it's, it's a symbol of a sign or a sign of the covenant or a cross. So basically, uh, the Aleph Tav is a picture of the strength of the covenant, which is through the cross through the death and resurrection of Yahshua. So the, before the word uh, tablets, we see the Aleph Tav there, so we understand that, <coughs> excuse me, Yeshua is involved in the writing of the Torah. He's involved in the revelation of Torah. Our understanding of Torah comes as a result of our relationship to Yeshua. It's not because Dave taught you something different you know, or because you read something on the internet, it's because Yeshua has revealed it to us. It's the Father's now speaking to us. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, Jeremiah 31, verse 30 through 33. And it reads, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the, the, the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hands and bring them out of the land of, bond, of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law, or my Torah, within them. And I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So the very writings that we see cut into the stones 
would now be written upon our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so, drawing is what? No man comes to me except for my Father draws him. How are we drawn to Yeshua? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Through the Ruach Bokadesh. Um, let's see here. Moses was instructed also to come up and meet Adonai on the mountain. And then it says what well, the Lord descended upon the mountain in the cloud. Now we see a lot of illustrations of this happening in the renewed covenant in the gospels. Remember when in uh, Mark chapter nine and verse seven, it says, and there was a cloud that overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And so it's while, while in his presence, that, that we're able to hear his voice. So when we're looking at his, his stone, the father and the sons, the tablets of stone, when we're looking at the word, we are there to hear his voice. It's so that the father can speak to us, so that we can have an intimate relationship with him. Remember, you know, Moses was instructed to take two tablets of stone into your hands before you meet the Lord. In other words, we read in scripture where it talks about uh, don't come before the Lord empty handed. And so what is he saying here? That when we come before him in his presence, we need to come basically our communication level has to be established or based upon his word. You know, we have when we, when we, when we pray and we come before his presence, we, we should have the word of God out there with us because really that's how God communicates both to him and to us is through his word. The things that he will say to us will be based upon the word. That is the language of the father and the son. Um, the cloud represents his presence, his anointing, his spirit. And it's, and it's in his presence that we hear his voice and recognize and understand and know who Yeshua really is. Verse or Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. And that no man can say that Yeshua is Lord, but through the Holy Spirit. In Mark chapter 13 and 26, it says, and they shall, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So in Exodus 34, we're seeing a foreshadow of Yahweh's return, of Yeshua's return coming through a cloud, coming, coming, and his testimony and witness is his commandments, his instructions. Don't let, don't let anyone fool you. Mark chapter 14 and 62, and Yeshua said, I am, only you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. The manifest presence of Elohim before Moses at the renewal of the covenant in the renewed covenant, his presence through the Ruach HaKadosh dwells in us all. In mercy, grace, he's slow to anger, great in goodness, and truth. Those are all, all attributes of the Father that dwell with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sins. This is the nature of the Father and the Son. This is the very nature of the Holy One that lives on the inside of us. The Torah that has been written upon our hearts. And so may we ever live in a manner that pleases the Father. May we ever live, and as we prepare during this month of Elul, we're coming into tabernacles. We're preparing to dwell what? In His presence during the festival of tabernacles. So I, I just want to encourage you with that. I just hope that this uh, study has been enlightening. I'm enjoying these, these uh, homework assignments. And may you all be blessed. Shabbat Shalom.